I'm Hemant Mehta. This is Jessica Blumke. And you're listening to the podcast for FriendlyAtheist.com. And we're here today with Zach Wienersmith, who you may know as the author of Saturday Morning Breakfast Serial, the wonderful webcomic. And he's also the author of a forthcoming book, Augie and the Green Knight, which we'll talk about in just a second. Zach, thanks for being with us. It's a pleasure. So I have to ask, what? Uh, how did you even get started? Because your webcomic is one of the few that I read on a regular basis. How do you even get started in something like that? Oh, man. Uh, I, I, I hesitate to give advice to anyone now because I did it so long ago. But um, I started the, what you might call the current run of a comic at least, say, 10 years ago. But really, you know, developing some kind of skills maybe 15 years ago. Uh, and mostly it's just been trying to post a comic every day and hoping people like it. I, I, I wish I had better advice. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things that I, I really like about the comic is that it has such a diverse array of subjects that you tackle. So one day it'll be making a joke about physics, another about math, another about biology. I mean, you have to know a lot of different subjects to and not just know them, but know them to a point where you can make jokes about them. So where is all this knowledge coming from? Are you just that smart? Are you studying these different subjects on a regular basis? Uh, well, yes and no. So one, I, I, I do cheat. Uh, I, I have a wife who's a biologist, and that helps with, uh, with a lot. But um, I, uh, well, I consider it my job to, uh, to um, do nerdy comics, so I, you know, nerds get mad at you if you're not accurate. In fact, I just, <laughs> I just screwed up yesterday on a on a physics joke, so I'm I'm not uh, certainly not perfect, but uh, but I do try to read a lot. That's my I feel, I feel like that's my main job in the universe at this moment is to intake information and uh, spit out amusing observations. Well, I find uh, in my personal experience that sort of the geek culture and the nerd culture they tend to be very possessive of their subjects. Do you find? Obviously, you said you kind of had a blunder yesterday. Do you find people get really up in arms when you mess something up? Uh, you know, I, in my experience, uh, I usually get the benefit of the doubt. I mean, now and then you get someone who's really angry, but uh, but I don't know, usually usually people have been pretty nice to me. But uh, I don't know. My, my general theory is uh, on that matter is you usually get the audience you deserve. So if you're the kind of person who is you know <laughs> comic about how everyone's wrong and you're right, you'll probably get an audience that feels the same way. Um, so I, I feel like I have a fairly sympathetic audience that will gently correct me uh, when I'm being stupid. <laughs> I've got that experience, too, writing for, uh, uh, Heaven and I write for the Friendly Atheist blog, and I find, I always say, like, we have the best readers, and they're so supportive, and they'll come to your defense if yeah. somebody attacks you, but if you use poor ro- poor logic or bad reasoning, they are on you. They won't <laughs> let you get away with anything. It's made me a more careful writer. Yeah. That's for sure. Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, that's good. What do you read, uh, for inspiration or just for, uh, fun? What other web comics do you read? What other comic strips do you read, if any? I, uh, I I do I read comics by my friends, uh, but actually, uh, almost as a policy, I don't really read comics um, because I don't, I don't want to sort of be uh, copying other people. You know, I, I would like to I would like to try to offer a um, a uh, unique as much as possible a unique comic. Uh, so I, so I, I actually don't read comics very much at all. Uh, to be honest, also comics are for children and idiots. You know. <laughs> so. so one thing uh, I don't know if you ever. If you ever see the comics pages, though, the ones that are still in the newspaper or whatever's left of newspapers these days, <laughs> they're, for the most part, most of those comic strips, the ones that are syndicated, the ones that are more famous that people read every day, they don't really strike me as funny. And maybe that's just me, but they don't they don't seem like they're that original, that unique or that clever. Well, it's because you're a young, hip guy. Oh, haven't? yeah. That's what I tell myself. Comics are for old people. <laughs> yeah. But, what what is it about those comics that makes them so appealing to the mass? What is it about those comics that are so appealing to the masses? And what do you think has been special about your comic that certainly draws a niche audience, uh, but you seem to have a very strong fan base? Uh, well, to answer this first question, my 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 inclination with the the Sunday comic page or you know the newspaper comics is. Uh, the incentivization structure. This is, this is a nerdy podcast, so I guess this is okay. Uh, the, <laughs> the incentivization scheme is kind of crummy, I think, because um, it's very hard to break in. I mean, once you're in, newspaper editors don't really uh, care about the cartoon section, so you're sort of in, and, and you get paid reasonably well if you're in enough newspapers. 
Um, but also just in terms of distribution, if you are a comic on the Sunday page, you're bundled with a ton of other content. Um, so one, you can, you can kind of hide out if people aren't actually laughing out loud at your comics. But two, uh, and this is the real bummer, is you can't do anything the least bit edgy or rage. I, I won't say maybe you can do the least bit edgy, um, but, but just the least bit edgy, you know, racy, um, sexy content. Like, like, uh, everyone, when Boondocks was in the papers, that was considered super edgy, but it's not even <laughs> close to anything on TV, you know? Right. Um, and so, uh, I think that's why you, you're recognizing that almost all of the comics, and there are exceptions, but most of the comics in the newspaper are these trite, banal, insipid, uh, Hallmark garbage comics, uh, I thought I just insulted like 10 million people. <laughs> but, uh, you know. You know what I'm talking about. Uh, but the strange thing is, you insulted a million people. None of them are the ones that are your fan base. Or we're listening to a <laughs> podcast <laughs> right now. So I got that going for me. Um, I guess it's that there are some, you know, I mean, Bill Watterson, I would say, was not the least bit edgy, at least in terms of the usual metrics for that. Um, and he still did beautiful stuff. So it's possible. It's just uh, not what you usually get, let's say. Um, what was the, the second question? Was uh, uh, what people read my comic? Well, you definitely inspire a lot of passionate uh, fans. And I, I don't necessarily hear about those passionate fans of, say, Garfield or something like that. Wait, yeah. no, hold on. I really like <laughs> well, Garfield. I mean, the, the, the passionate fans of Garfield are uh, 10 years old. Is, uh, I think, uh, Come to Muncie, maybe, Indiana uh, with me. The, There's a mural you're, you're, of You're him. in with the wrong crowd. Um, <laughs> but uh, in, in terms of my comic, I, I have no idea, honestly. I, I actually, it surprises me whenever I hear from someone who says, you know, I've been reading a comic for five or ten years or something because the comic has changed. Like, you know, I, I feel like every two years or so, I, it, it changes fairly significantly. Uh, and so it, it really surprises me that people do that. I, I wonder if part of it is they're just sort of they're um, contemporary with me age-wise, and so they sort of grow up with me and, and keep reading, so maybe that's part of it. But, uh, but I, would, I would say to the, to the extent I feel I have any advantage over other comics is I at least feel like, I try most of the time to, to be putting out content that I don't think other people could do. I, like, if I have an observation, I think someone else probably has already made. I, I try to avoid it. I, I really, I, I really try very hard to have um, uh, new ideas. I, I, uh, I often fail at that. I, I did. I, I did a while back. I did a joke. It's, I, I feel like an idiot saying this. Even I did a joke about T Rex having small arms, and then I got informed by every paleontologist that that's like it's like an insult to paleontology. They're like, of course. T-Rex has small arms. It's the oldest, stupidest joke. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, so, so heads up, you know, the T-Rex small arms joke has already been, been taken. But uh, but I, I do try. I think that's the thing a lot of people skip. They want to have, they want to try to do joke ideas that are familiar and, you know, will go viral, et cetera. And, and I think that's, that's maybe a good short term. But in the long term, I do think you want to try to differentiate yourself. Uh, and so I, I do try to do that. What is it? One of the things that is is really amazing about your work that I found is that you, yeah, you do your comic on a daily basis, and you put out a comic every single day, and then on the side you seem to be doing, I don't know, it feels like a hundred other projects. You're working on a new book. You're you're putting out a video with SMBC Theater or something. Uh, first of all, one, where do you find the time to do all this? And two, what is it that drives you to do so many different types of things? Because it's never just drawing, and it's never just writing. It's always something different. I, uh, in terms of finding time, uh, I should say we just had a baby two and a half months ago, so the time is uh, is drying up real fast. Um, <laughs> Congrats. But, um, but, but usually I do, I do actually keep a sort of life schedule, like you know, a list of things to do to, during each day, and it's, it's fairly extensive. I mean... I'm also a profoundly boring person. I uh, think like if I didn't have to, I would never leave my living room. Um, I kind of just try to sit around reading books all day to the extent that I can, uh, and uh, so so that helps. Um, but I, in terms of desire to do it, um, I don't know. I, I feel like people are very impressed by the daily comics thing. But I've been doing it so long, it doesn't. It just it, it's like riding a bicycle. Or you know, you know, you know, like you see someone who can do an amazing trick, like someone who can juggle five balls, and it's very impressive. But it's like. Once you can do it, it's not a big deal to keep doing it. Um, Once you get in so the groove, I, I kind of feel like I have the comic writing thing um, fairly well at hand, which means I have you know free time and and I have all these stupid things that I, I want to check off my list. Uh, and uh, and writing good book is one thing I'm doing now, and that's um, that's sort of a thing I wanted to do for a very. Actually, I think before I wanted to do comics, I wanted to write kids' books. So I'm sort of using the both the platform and the available time I've created to to. Uh, to see how bad I am at uh, other things. 
<laughs> to see how messed up you can warp kids' minds. <laughs> oh, yeah, hopefully. They need more warping. There's not enough warping in, in uh, books these days. Books were a lot more screwed up uh, 50 years ago. It's better that way. So what is Augie and the Green Knight all about? That's your new book that you are kickstartering right now. Yes. Um, well, um, where to begin? Uh, Augie and the Green Knight. Uh, well, are you uh, either of you familiar with the old medieval romance, uh, Sir Gawain and the Green Knight? Yep. I've, I'm vaguely you, familiar. I, it's okay. It's okay. I have a literature degree. This is a. Uh, <laughs> oh, me too. I, in, in my original write up for the Kickstarter, I was like, now you probably, probably all know this story. And she was like, nobody knows this story. <laughs> um, so there's, there's a very famous. Uh, um, Medieval romance called Gawain and the Green Knight. It's actually quite quite readable for a, uh, I think I want to say 15th century uh, story. Um, and I'll, I'll give you the the story in miniature just to not waste time. The, the basic story is King Arthur and his court are sitting around and uh, for Christmas, I believe. And one day this um, giant green knight shows up and he says, "Let's play a game where one of you beheads me, and then later I behead one of you." That sounds fun. <laughs> and uh, and uh, Sir Gawain. Uh, stands up, uh, and he says, I'll be the one to do it. And so he cuts off the Green Knight's head, and then the Green Knight picks up his head and says, all right, great, uh, and then says, I'll see you in a year at my place. And then the story is about Sir Gawain going to this other place and finding it, and uh, I won't spoil the ending uh, for you. But it's like it's, it, you see it's sort of a comedic um, drama story. It's very, very good. Um, if you can get past a little of the old-timey <laughs> language. But anyway, so the, the, my book... Um, is a sort of retelling of that story with the injection of this character of a little, very rational, very scientific girl who sort of falls into this fantasy setting where there's this green knight who's on his way to go behead uh, or get beheaded. And she falls into this situation where the green knight is going to behead Sir Gawain and doesn't understand why it's a problem because he might do that. And so the story is kind of, there's more to it than this, but the main story is her sort of trying to argue with him about whether it's okay to do this, um, and uh, and using a, a lot of scientific or rational or mathematical ways to uh, to discuss it. And is it intended to be? I know um, the story itself is just one. Is it intended to be a series with this little girl, or is this just a one-off? Uh, I it's intended to be a, a, a one-off, I suppose. Uh, although. So it's funny because I, 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 I had this idea for this story uh, maybe a couple of years ago, and I really liked uh, the idea of you know, retelling the story from a little girl's uh, perspective. And uh, But it, it definitely, it's written as if it's a one-off. Um, I can imagine, I mean, this this thing, I, I did not expect this project to do as well as it's done so far, and so now I'm, I feel like, I, you know, everything's on the table. I've, I've uh, it, this book is kind of a book I, I, I in a big way, wrote because uh, I wanted to read it to my kid. And um, so if if people seem to like it, and I still don't know, people are kind of going on faith with this project, but I hope they like it. And if they do, I, I, would, I think I'd, at this point be happy to write a sequel. But it, the, the original is not written as if it's like the adventures of this kid doing this one thing. It's it's, it's meant to be a whole story with a beginning and, and, and a change in the outlook of the character, that sort of thing. Uh, but... I, would, I wouldn't be averse to uh, doing another one. So let's talk about the success of this. I mean, you had a Kickstarter goal yeah. of $30,000, and as we're talking right now, and there's still weeks left in your Kickstarter, it's already at uh, $220,000. <laughs> yeah. What is it? Why are so many people giving to this project? Do you think it's because they support you? Do they really like the story? What is it that inspires this passionate fan base? Teach us the secret of your ways, please. <laughs> I uh, I wish I knew. I, mean, I have some thoughts, I guess. Uh, I mean, I do have. I just have a, a fan base who are nice enough to sort of follow. I, I think at this point, people are used to me doing weird projects, and and you know, we we do try to make sure they're always high quality, so that you know, me, even if you buy it, it's not your cup of tea. At least you know, I, we, I I don't want you to feel like you know we're just shoving stuff off on you. Uh, so I, I think we, we. I hope we have a good track record, um, but also this one, from a business perspective, has some nice hooks on it, which is. Uh, um, I mean, it, as, as I noted it on the Kickstarter, it, at least as far as I know, there are not a ton of stories that have the kind of um, female protagonist I would like to read to my daughter about. Uh, that is, even the good ones, um, the, the, like even the characters who aren't, you know, completely helpless, do tend to be, you know, academic rule-following types. You know, like there, there aren't 
a lot of sort of adventurous girls. Uh, you know, I think I feel like the, the one thing I, I feel like I almost never see is a, a female lead who's who's okay looking stupid. You know, like <laughs> trying something and making a mistake and uh, and feeling ashamed and getting back up. You know, I feel like, like even you get you get good characters like Hermione Granger say, but they're still sort of they're the ones telling the boys now calm down and uh, and uh, relax. You know, and I, I wanted to write a girl who is not just smart, you know, like had read books, et cetera, but who, uh, who could get into trouble. Um, I thought, I thought I, I hadn't read much of that. And I, uh, and it's also, it was a bummer cause I, I, I love old Victorian adventure novels and, um, this isn't quite in that vein, but I, I just, it sucks because I have all these books that I love that I probably can never read to my daughter because they're Victorian. So they're chock full of racism. <laughs> uh, so I, I kind of, I kind of wanted to bark up that tree a little to sort of recreate some of these some of what I like about those stories uh, without without them being full of racism and sexism and, oh, a little anti-Semitism and nationalism. And <laughs> Gotta love those things. anti-Semitic children's books. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it sucks, doesn't it? <laughs> um, how, does, how does having a child, I mean, it's only been a couple months, but how has that impacted sort of the work you do? Has that influenced, has that influenced any of your comics at all? Is that going to change? Uh, the type of work that you do? Are you going to focus on more children's work now? I, I in, in my main comic, I definitely sort of, despite myself, find myself doing more jokes about parenting and about kids. But I, I'm 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 adamant that I'm not going to start doing cute comics. <laughs> I refuse. Um, but so that that hasn't. Uh, I, I feel like I haven't softened, which makes me feel good because I, I talked to a lot of dads who are like, oh, you know, there's some stuff I don't I don't like to joke about anymore, and and I, I guess I don't feel that way. I think it's still funny. Um, <laughs> But, uh, but I do, yeah, I definitely, I do want, I, even if we don't do a sequel per se to this book, I have a couple other projects. I, I kind of just, it's, it's probably just crazy parent stuff, but I'm like, I really want to write a lot of little girl hero books because there just aren't a lot of them. And it drives me nuts when you read, uh, like, or, I mean, it's not so bad right now because she's three months old. So all the books, her, her books are like <laughs> 10 words long. Um, so there's not a lot of space for them to be, uh, Asinine. Uh, although some of them, they, you know, they get there. But, uh, but, uh, it, it really drives me up a wall. You read these adventure books and they almost always have a girl character who's just, like, just passive, you know? And it kills me. And I'm like, you know, it, it just, it all seems much more urgent all of a sudden. So I'm, I'm, I'm sure that'll uh, be something I work on. I feel like recently there's been kind of that uprising of people criticizing Disney princesses which is something I was just talking to um, a friend of mine who has a daughter that, like, I, it was never something that occurred to me when I was a kid that Snow White had absolutely no faculty unto herself. Like, everything that happened to her happened because something else happened. And I, right. I don't know, I read all the Disney princesses and watched the movies growing up, and I'm, I don't know, I, I wonder how much does that really affect us. And I'm not saying, it, clearly, I'm sure it has some, it has a larger cultural effect on us all, but... As individuals, I wonder how much of an effect loving Disney princesses had me had on me. So I I I, I, can, I, I know a little. Bit. So I just uh, by by coincidence, I happened to uh, online meet uh, Professor uh, Lynn Leiben, L I B E N, and she was one of three authors on an excellent textbook called Gender Development, um, which I highly recommend because, as I'm sure you both know, anything with the word gender in it is super political and fraught and impossible to discuss on the internet. This this book <laughs> is very empirical, very um, it, it, as empirical as you could hope for uh, on on such a topic. And so there is evidence that, and you know, there's, there's always a chicken before the egg argument here, but there is evidence that girls who have what they call a stronger gender schema. That is, girls who believe in sort of more gender essentialism when it comes to things like what jobs you can do uh, tend to experience uh, the uh, infamous fall off in math ability late in high school at a higher rate than girls who don't have that. Um, now, whether that comes directly from Disney princesses, I don't know. But um, but so that having read that, it, it made me sort of concerned, you know, to make sure. That I, I mean, for whatever I do, I, I don't want my daughter to think that. Uh, jobs or, you know, you know, occupations or hobbies or whatever fall along gender lines, um, uh, at least in a biological sense. Um, so, I, 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 like I say, it's very hard to draw a cause and effect line from uh, the fact that Snow White is not a plot-making character to, uh, you know, my daughter suddenly started hitting maths in 10th grade. 
Um, but uh, there, there does seem to be a correlation. And, and furthermore, it, it, it varies from country to country. So, so clearly there is a cultural effect right. um, at work. Um, one of the... Uh, oh, yeah. No, I'm sorry about that. Uh, one of the questions no. that, since you're talking about math, I think at one point, and I don't know if you still do this, you had a website where you were kind of explaining calculus concepts, and it wasn't funny. It was actually, you were explaining calculus concepts. <laughs> where was that yeah. coming? Was that for you? Was that for an audience? And what was the purpose uh, of that site? So, yeah, I, I actually, I'm hoping to get back to it. Things got uh, a bit derailed uh, with this whole baby thing, and, and you know, my, my wife is an <laughs> academic, so we move a lot, so I, I got a little behind on it, but I was really enjoying it. Um, yeah, so I, I um, you know, I, I don't know if you know my, my academic history, but I, I have a degree in literature, and I decided years later to go back, long story short, to get a degree in physics. I got a little less than halfway through, and then all of a sudden, comics were doing well, and I was like, you know, I need to do the thing that pays money. Right, uh, because I like king and not dying, and so um, <laughs> those are important values for it's me. It's always and a good I, way uh, to live your so life. I quit, but I figured you know, I could self teach on the side, um, and so uh, I ended up doing all these other projects. And I, I kind of had to set it aside, which was a real bummer because it, it really makes me happy to do it. And so finally, I guess where I was getting back to it, but I was like, you know, I, I learned calculus in college, but I didn't feel like I learned it super rigorously, and I feel like the the acid test of whether you know something is whether you can explain it. Um, and so I thought, well, what I should do is force myself to, you know, read a chapter, but then you have to explain it to somebody through a blog. Mm -hmm. And I figured, you know, it's probably good to do, I'm sure it's good to do just for myself. And that was the main reason I did it. But it was also, I do think some people benefited from it. Um, it was also good because I had to explain something and think I was pretty smart. And then someone would be like, not nah, you're wrong. You got it exactly backwards. Uh, so that was useful. So it was just, I, it, was, it was actually really nice. I, I even had a couple times, actually, this this is such a good nerd story. I was at a party at San Diego <laughs> Comic Con and a guy was there with his husband and he was just there. He wasn't like a Hollywood guy or anything. He was just there, like I said, in support because it was neat. He was a med student. He said the one thing that was giving him trouble was trigonometry. And because I had, I had actually gone back and gone through trig, which I sort of understood superficially the first time, I said to him, um, you know, what the big trick is, is that there's only one trig function, and it's called sine, or it's called cosine, or whatever you want to right. call it. But there's only one trig function, everything else you can derive from the one thing. And uh, he, he was funny, because I, I feel like I've never done anything worthwhile to humanity at a San Diego Comic-Con. But I got <laughs> an email from him, like, six months later, and he was like, hey, I wanted you to know that really helped me, uh, for whatever reason, uh, get through this. So so it, it actually ended up being useful. I feel like the, the subjects that I covered under that blog are ones that I actually understand, whereas the stuff that I, I learned in school, sometimes it's a little, it's like a weak structure. You, know, you, 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 you think it's fine, but you poke at it, and uh, you realize there's a lot of problems with it. Yeah, that's interesting. The first time I learned trigonometry myself, I think I felt the same way. It was superficial. I don't know mm -hmm. that I really understood it. And only in the past few years of literally teaching, teaching trigonometry to, to high school yep. sophomores. Yep. And actually, I used that exact same thing you were saying where, no, this, this is the only trig function you need to know. Everything else is a derivation of that one. And really focusing yep. on that understanding. And it seemed like the students picked up on that as well. Well, I think sometimes you don't... I, I agree, yeah, it's Oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, I think sometimes you don't know what you know until somebody asks you the right question. I This is completely different from math, but I used to teach horseback riding lessons, and these kids would ask me these questions, and I would have never come up with this thing to tell them. And they'd ask me, I was like, oh, I do, I know all of this stuff. It just took people asking the right questions or right. putting it in the right way to make you realize what you know. I actually now ask my students on their exams, like, don't just don't just solve this trig problem. Um, there's a great subreddit called Explain It Like I'm Five. Just yeah. explain it in uh -huh. a way that makes yeah. sense to me. And I literally ask them, like, there's some eight-year-old who says, you know, sine of this angle is uh, 1.5. Tell me why, if that kid is right or wrong, and if it's wrong, tell me why. And they have to explain, like, right. why that answer can't make any sense. And I think I've learned more yeah. from their responses to that about how well they understand the material mm -hmm. than anything else I've done. Well, that's like when I was younger and studying math in high school or junior high before that, and they would always say, show your work, show your yeah. work. And I didn't, at the time, it wasn't explained to me why showing my work isn't important. But now as an adult, looking back on that, like, of course that's much more important than getting the right, right answer is how you did it. Do you feel, yep. Zach, that the calculus that you were explaining has stuck with you then? I think so. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, it's, especially, it's like with that sign thing, like, um, 
if you sell, tell someone everything is signed, it doesn't actually, it's not in a certain sense new information. It's just kind of a different way of thinking. Like, I feel like as a student, you're like, oh, so there aren't six things. There's one thing. And it's sort of relaxing. I feel like stuff like that, like I used to, I feel like I didn't used to have a, a sort of sense of Euler's uh, constant, Euler's, well, E. I didn't have a sense of like what E is. I knew that you could do tricks on it. And now I, I sort of have a more, I, I, I like intuitive sense of it. Or like, it, like, like I, you, you know, you learn how to push around uh, a derivative, but you don't have a sense of like, what am I doing? You know, yeah, what, what, does, what, what does this mean in reality in the universe uh, that, that I've done this thing to these numbers? You know, I, I feel like that's that, that's what was better the second time around is uh, is, is getting a, a sort of general like you know it's like when, if someone asks you a question, can you tell them sort of what the answer should be uh, without having to do the math? And that, that's where I feel I got to. Does that happen when you're drawing comics about other subjects as well? When you're uh, doing a comic about psychology or something, do you feel like you really understand those concepts that you're making fun of, or do you have a superficial understanding of it enough to make the joke, but maybe you don't necessarily yeah. understand it? What I do is I, I try, I really do try to get to where I like, I, I understand uh, a concept well, uh, although now and then I do, I do cheat a little. Like I had, I just did one um, that was about, uh, it was a really stupid joke. It was uh, um, this couple and, uh, uh, one decides they uh, aren't going to have sex tonight because, according to the efficient market hypothesis, if uh, the sex were a good idea, it would have already happened by now. You know, <laughs> this is at equilibrium. So, um, but actually, wasn't, I wasn't sure if that was quite the right way to say it. So I got in touch with a friend of mine named uh, Jody Beggs, um, who runs a, a, an economics blog, and she's a behavioral economist, but she runs a blog called um, Economist Do with Models. Uh-huh. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, uh, but, but so she actually, she changed the wording a little for me. So it was more accurate. Um, and so, so I do it when I'm, when I'm really far afield from stuff, I think I know, but I do try to bug someone. The only problem is it's the moment you bring in someone who's an expert, you're asking for them to be like, well, you need to add 14 more words here to, right. to clarify the joke. You know, and then you're in trouble. Fair enough. <laughs> Yeah. So what are your upcoming projects now that you're uh, once this next book is done? Are you going to continue with more children's books or are you going to try to do something different and then come back to the books that you want to write? Uh, I'll tell you what I can tell you. I have, I have a lot of projects. With, uh, I don't like to when something's really um, uh, tenuous. Uh, I, I don't want to talk about it because um, it might never happen. Uh, but stuff I am definitely doing. Um, we are holding two festivals of bad ad hoc hypotheses in October this year. Um, which uh, should be pretty fun. Um, what else am I doing? Uh, I, I am working on some more kids' books, but it's a little too uh, up in the air to say. Um, yeah, my, mostly I'm, I'm trying to get into prose writing projects. I'm, I'm, I like comics, but I'd like to explore some more long-form narrative stuff. Very cool. Well, Zach, thank yeah. you so much for joining us today. Uh, you could find Zach. Zach, what's the exact title of your URL so we get that right? It's uh, SMB hyphen comics.com awesome and you can support Zach's Kickstarter for Augie and the Green Knight that's going on until July 2nd uh, once again I'm Hemant Mehta this is Jessica Bloomke and this is the podcast for friendlyatheist.com if you like what you're hearing uh, feel free to go to patreon.com slash Hemant that's he man T and uh, contribute if you like what you're hearing thanks so much and Zach thank you again for joining us